Now, uh, I want you to start out, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to, I hope I remember this, I looked this up right before I come out here, 1 Timothy, uh, I believe, First, I think, yeah, 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, yeah, here we go, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and then we'll get into some of the notes that I have here, 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, Let's say uh, verse 3. Let's pick it up in, in verse 3. Well, let's go back to verse 1 so we get the context of it. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Here, Paul's laying out to Timothy and to us that your private life, out, private life outside of the walls of this church matter. Your life outside of these walls matter. It matters to the lost people that you're around day in and day out. People that you work with, people that you are family members with, people that you are friends with, either in real life or fake book life or whatever it is. You're around people out there who are either going to praise God for you or they're going to mock God because of you. Because you say you're a Christian and you say you go to church, and you say you believe the Bible, but your life is everything but what you say. And this world now, we don't, we don't live in the Christian nation that our forefathers lived in a hundred years ago. We don't live in that country anymore. That's obvious. Amen? That is obvious today. And so your lost family members and your lost friends, they are sick and tired of the phony, fake, Christians who mouth off about everything they are, and yet the people out there know them and how they really are. And so he says, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Because lost people are going to see right through you. Can I get somebody to say amen to that? They, that, that, was, that was kind of weak. They all, has everybody got the flu tonight? Okay. Thank you, Ron. They that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit these things teach and exhort. I was, I've been guilty of all of this. Okay? It's the reason why I'm preaching it so loud and so hard. I have been guilty. I've been in church practically all my life, and at times I've made myself real big in front of the world and in front of other people, making myself out to be something that I wasn't, and trying to act like I'm good here, and then out there I'm not. I've, I've been all of that, and I'm telling you, lost people see right through it, and they'll hate your guts for it. They will never come to the Lord, and... I, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm just telling you, let's, if we're going to, if we're say we're saved here, we believe the Bible, and we live right in here, let's do it out there too. And even in the place that you work, are you listening to me? Where's my daughters? And <laughs> in the place where you work, which is here, <laughs> you have a believing master. That would be me. Don't despise me. Amen. That goes for you too, Rose. I hear you back there. Okay? But rather do daddy's service. Amen. Because they're faithful and beloved. But anyway, wherever you work, wherever you are, be God's people out there as much as you are in here. Amen? All right. Now, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, okay? If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words. And he's going to define that. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He's talking about the words of Jesus Christ. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, 
perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. And I'm being dead honest, okay? Even though practically everything I do gets posted to Facebook, myself, I don't go on Facebook very much. And when I do, it usually turns out that I get into it with somebody over something. And I don't like that. I can be real cocky and I can be real, um, real mean when I'm just typing something to an unknown person and I can hide behind my computer screen and my keyboard and I can be real big and act real tough and mean and put people down over what they believe versus what I believe and I don't like that about my... If you don't like that about me, you're with me. I don't like it about me either. And it gets me in trouble because there is a lot of garbage posted on Facebook and I want to jump down everybody's throat over it and it's not right. That's not what I'm called to do. Um, and so I just try to stay away from it as it is... I'll be honest with you, it is one of my weaknesses. And I'm not sure that God's given me the grace yet to overcome that to where I can be of some sort of presence on Facebook. I will use social media to promote our sermons, our live streaming, and whatnot. But when it comes to reading everybody's post and then reading everybody's comments and what they've got to say about me, if I answered everybody that had some kind of stupid railing accusation against me on YouTube and Facebook and everything else, I would be wasting a lot of my time that I could be reading the Bible because it would take quite a bit of time. So I just try to stay out of it. Our job is to teach the wholesome words of our Lord Jesus Christ and doctrine which is according to godliness. Can I get God's people to say amen? That's what we're supposed to be doing, okay? Uh, godly, verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But I'm going to go back to this verse 3 here. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions. So the attack here that Paul mentioned was specifically upon the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to remember that, hang on to it, and look up there on the screen, turn to Matthew 13, and I want to kind of go over this just very quickly, and then I want to move forward into uh, like a news article that I'm going to show you in a little bit where somebody did exactly this. A very pious, holy, reverend type gentleman did this. Matthew chapter 30, verse 24, and I say that with my tongue planted in my cheek. Uh, another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. I lost my notes here. Hang on a second. There we go. Come on. There we go. All right. Uh, verse 26, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gathered up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we are living in the times right now where we are next door neighbors to the tares. We're living amongst them. We're surrounded by them. We are neighbors to them. We are family members, and in some cases, close family members to people who are nothing but tares. And the devil has spent years sowing his lies and deceit into their mind and heart, and they are going to ridicule you. They're going to mock you. They're going to 
they're going to try to condescend to you and act like they're trying to help you out of that cult religion that you've fallen into. Believe in that Bible and all that stuff. That Bible was written by men. Don't you know that? I go to church just like you do, and we are taught that the Bible was written by men. And we follow this and we follow that. We follow the Spirit. We don't go along with that, that Bible stuff. You're living around people and have family members that are tares. And the enemy has sown them in right next to you. And you're going to have to learn how to deal with it. And you're going to have to learn how not to be a tear yourself. Amen? What I'm saying to you is, at some point... And I'm not speaking to one person in particular. At some point, everybody has to be able to stand on their own two feet in what they believe, what they're not changing their mind on, what they live for, and what they are going to die for. At some point, everybody's going to have to have their own faith. Lisa and I, we saw the times where our girls, they were the oldest, they were older than Matthew, they were older than Caleb, and we had, at some point, we knew that the life that we instilled in them, the things that we tried to teach them, the faith that we tried to give them, at some point, they had to transform from leaning on us for it to standing on their own two feet and having it themselves. Because mom and, when God asks questions in heaven, He doesn't care who your mom and daddy was. Oh, your dad was Mike Hoggart? Oh, sure, come on in. Don't wait. I don't care if you're saved or not. Come on in. Mike Hoggart is a great guy. That is, that's nowhere in your Bible. Okay? So we knew that at some point, it was going to have to be their faith and them standing on their own two feet on it. Dad and Mom can't prop them up anymore. They're going to have to grow up. And let me just say this. We live in a society right now that I don't think we've ever seen before. We have adult men and women in their late 20s and 30s Still living at home with mom and dad. Still feeding off mom and dad. And it's not that they went out and tried it and failed. It's just that they have never stepped outside of mom and, sat, mom and dad's doorstep. And mom and dad takes care of them. Mom, they don't have a job. They don't have a place. They have nothing. And they're not going anywhere. And this is, this is the life that a lot of young people have chosen for themselves. Mom and dad lets them get by with it. And those adults are not able to stand on their own. And in the case of faith, I've seen it over and over and over. In this church, kids grew up. When they got out, Melissa, they're gone. They're not in church. And unless God does something in their life, they're not ever going to be in church. Because mom and dad did it for them. And now they have nothing to lean on and they're out there. They're tares is what they are. So you're surrounded by tares. Your neighbors are tares. Your family members are tares. Your friends, maybe good friends, they're tares. We have tares in our government that are working against the word of God. Do you believe that one? Every day, every day, there's a fierce battle over this Bible. There are tear churches that are nothing but tares. The enemy has sold them in this town. How many churches are there in this town, you reckon? Just in Festus, Crystal City. What do you think, Chris? 15, 20, I'd say probably... 50, maybe more. All kinds of different breeds, all kinds of different doctrines, ideologies, and things like that. And the ones that are actively teaching the Bible as the Word of God, 
Very rare to find. Very hard to find. Now, um, go to, uh, well, let's go to verse 37. Let's have the explanation here, and then we're going to move on. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. You see, it's your neighbors. It's your family members. It's friends that you used to have. It is... Megan, it's kids that we went to Christian Academy with, okay, that are not serving the Lord, and they're not, probably not going to the way they're going. How many of them do you know? How many, you went to Christian, how many kids that, that you went to Christian school with are still actively in church, living for the Lord? Not very many, not very many. And I'll tell you that, I, I, listen, I believe you ought to train your children right. I think we did right by teaching our kids in this school. I think we're still doing right by having Melissa do it. But I'm going to tell you, tell you what I've learned in my lifetime. Christian school is no guarantee and no substitute for real salvation in children's lives. Because... I've seen it. I've talked, I've talked to preachers everywhere. They've seen it. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, we tried to build Christian schools everywhere. Tried to train children and because we knew the public schools weren't going to do it. And I don't know if this is true about everybody, but I guess the thinking was if they go to Christian school, they'll turn out right and won't have any problems out of them. And that's not the case. It's not the case. And it seems like that parents or churches put a Christian school as a substitute for real, true, bona fide salvation. Because when they got out of the Christian school and they got out in the world, what happened to them? Boom, they're gone. Out doing exact, it's almost like, it's almost like they're in as deep as the lost kids were who were going to public school. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? I'm not knocking Christian school. I'm just saying, this is what I've seen happen in my lifetime. By the grace of God, there are some that will still around. Amen? By the grace of God alone. So the tares are everywhere. They offend and they do iniquity. They shall be cast into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And this whole thing has been about the devil's attack on the Word of God. If you remember, what we just read earlier was about, if any man consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what we have is, in fact, I'll give you a little quiz. Uh, free DVD and book. If you can tell me how many books of the Bible the words of Jesus are recorded in. Free DVD, free book. How many? 66. Red letter edition. <laughs> how many books of the Bible are Jesus' words actually recorded in? Who said 33? Wrong. Jared. Jared says six. Wrong. You don't get two chances. Four. Wrong. Well, it's at least four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, First Corinthians. Let's see, we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, First Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, I believe, and Revelation. There's eight. Okay? There's eight of them. Now, if anybody can, if anybody can show me wrong, you get a free book in the DVD, too. I don't know where you're going to get it from, but you'll get one somewhere, I'm sure. Go to Goodwill or something like that. Anyway, 
That's just a little quiz, I thought. The words of Jesus, among all the words in the Bible, and I know all the words in the Bible are equal, but if anything belongs in the Bible, it would be the words of Jesus Christ. Amen? Take a look at this up here. Here's, the, here's your Roman Catholic Church. The Jesuit, The Jesuits. The, the real name of their group is the Society of Jesus. Sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Jesuit Superior General said, We don't know what Jesus really said. We don't know what he really said. Coming out of the top levels of the Catholic Church is nothing but corrosive doubt concerning the words that are in your Bible, including the words that Jesus himself spoke. When I say corrosive words, I mean the Catholic Church and, and those who work in the Catholic Church do not limit their, their influence only upon Roman Catholics. Their influence is seen. Remember this picture. These are the men who formed together the Greek New Testament that all the modern translations, including... Uh, English Standard Version, New American Standard Bible, the New King James Version, and all these, the, the new Greek text that all these modern translations used to translate the Bible. And here you have, uh, you have uh, Bruce Metzger. There he is meeting with Pope Paul. There's Metzger meeting with Pope John Paul II. You have uh, Kurt Aland. There's... Kurt Alon meeting with both popes. And then you have, over on the far right, a guy with no tie on. His name is Carlos Martini. He is a Jesuit priest. And he was sitting, Ron, on the committee that formed the new New Testament. A Jesuit priest. Jesuit, let me tell you about the Jesuits. The Jesuits hate Protestantism. And the whole thing about the Jesuit society was formed to defeat, to be as a military group of the Vatican, to defeat every Protestant church and religion in the world. That was their goal. To destroy those who did not come and conform under the Roman Catholic Church. It's their stated purpose to destroy them. So here is, here is this Jesuit. He's the Jesuit Superior General. We don't know what Jesus really said. Here is Carlo Martini, a Jesuit who has sworn a vow that he's going to destroy Protestantism. Sitting on the committee that formed the Greek New Testament. And all the Bible colleges, I went to two of them, all the Bible colleges, all the scholars, all the, all the pastors, they're all following this same line of thought that that New Greek Testament is far better than the Greek New Testament that King James came from, so we're all going to go to that direction. And you've got men that hate God and hate Jesus and hate His Word telling the churches what Bible they ought to read. And nobody says anything about it. Here's, here's who he is, Cardinal Martini. In 1962, he was chairman of the Textual Criticism Committee at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. He was a liberal contender. He's a liberal in the Vatican, like Pope Francis is. Liberal contender for the papal throne in 2005. He lost to uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope... Scary-looking guy. What was his name? Before Pope Francis. Pope Benedict. The guy was creepy-looking. Okay? And here's what he said about sodomites. I disagree with the positions of those in the church that take issue with civil unions. He said, it is not bad, instead of casual sex between two men, that two people have a certain stability and that the state could recognize them. In other words, what he said, isn't it better than these men just going around, just having it with one another? Isn't it better that they come together and be married? Bless God. And he said, I understand gay pride parades when they support the need for self-affirmation. This man sat on the committee that put the Bibles together. 
the NIV, the New American Standard, the New English Standard Version, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the Message Bible, the New King James has readings that are based upon these new manuscripts. They, they varied from the, text, uh, from the uh, Texas Receptus. The, on this, concerning this new Greek manuscript, here is a list, this is from Wikipedia. Here's a list now of the Bibles in order, in the order that they agree with the Martini Aland Metzger Greek text. Top of the list is the New American Standard Bible. It agrees the most with that New Greek text. New American Standard. The American Standard Version is number two. New American Standard 1995 update is, is number three. Then you have the New American Bible, the English Standard Version, the Holman Christian Standard, which is the Southern Baptist own Bible. New Revised Standard Version, New English Translation, Revised Standard, New International Version, New Jerusalem Bible, Revised. The King James at the bottom. It is the least, it is the Bible that least agrees with the Kurt Aland, um, Martini, Bruce Metzger text, meaning King James and that new Greek text don't get along very well. Somebody say amen. Okay? Now, the New American Standard Bible came out in 1971, commissioned by the Lockman Foundation, a man by the name of Dewey Lockman. He had a bunch of money, and he wanted a new Bible. He was friends with a man by the name of Frank Logsdon. And he asked Frank, he said, Frank, would you, he knew Frank to be a good man, good Bible scholar, and a good Christian. He said, Frank, will you be on the translating committee? And Frank said, well, sure, do it, I'll do anything you ask. So Frank Logston gets on the committee to translate the New American Standard Bible. As the translation process goes forth, and Frank Logston sees that they're going to abandon the Textus Receptus from where the King James came from and migrate over to this new Greek text that was under the hands of the popes and the Jesuits, Frank Logston started seeing what they were doing to the Bible. And as time went on, and the more he saw, he finally ended up backing completely away from the project, wrote a letter to Dewey Lockman, who was his good friend, and said, I know we're friends, but I've seen what's being done to God's Word here. And he said, if I stand before you, I may come under judgment of you because I'm backing away from this project. But if I stand in front of God, I have God who's going to judge me on what I do about this. And he said, I cannot have anything to do with this translation because of what you're doing to the New Testament and to the Bible in general, and he said, I'll have nothing to do with it, and he withdrew from it. And Frank Logston spent the rest of his life going from church to church to church, preaching, and the guy's an excellent preacher, preaching to the churches that they should never, ever accept the New American Standard Bible and they should stick with the King James because he was convinced it was the Word of God. Okay? And most of the guys that I used to run with, when I would ask them, what Bible do you use? Well, when I study, I use the New American Standard. Why do you use that? What's the closest to the original Greek and Hebrew? And they say that all the time. And that is the pet Bible of probably most pastors and preachers. They'll read from that and think that they're reading the Word of God. And here the man who was set to translate it said, Don't use that Bible. It's a setup. It's a trap. The New International Version, owned by Zondervan Publishing, which is owned by HarperCollins, which is owned by News Corp., which is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Harper Collins also owns Thomas Nelson Publishers. Now, follow the trail here. Zondervan Publishing publishes the New International Version. 
And that's owned by Harper Collins, and that's owned by News Corp, and which is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch also owns, he owns Harper Collins Publishers that publishes the Satanic Bible. The same company is printing Bibles in one factory and Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible in another one. Matthew chapter 7, turn there in your Bibles, Matthew 7. Verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree... Now, I just want to ask you, a publishing company that publishes the Satanic Bible, the good tree or bad tree? So, a good tree bringing forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringing forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, whereby by their fruits ye shall know them. You just follow the money trail. Okay? Why, why would a printing company, let's say a publishing company, why would a publishing company decide to go print King James Bibles here in America when they could establish their own private translation of the Bible, which is copyrighted under their name? And because it's copyrighted, that shows that it is significantly different than the King James. That's what a copyright shows. That they've got a Bible out there, and it's you know all over the world and all over the country, and because their translation is significantly different than the King James, there's never a copyright issue between the King James and the NIV. Whoever the the King James Bible is owned by the British Crown. And it's administered by Oxford and uh, Cambridge. And Cambridge and Oxford cannot sue Zondervan Publishing for stealing the Bible because Zondervan Publishing didn't steal the Bible. They printed their own. And it's significantly different than the King James. That's what that copyright shows. So you know them by their fruits. Here is Sodom's infiltration. You remember the vine of Sodom. According to GayChristian.com, the chairman of the NIV Old Testament, Old Testament Committee, Martin Wildstra, was a homosexual. Chairman of the committee. It is known publicly that another translator, Virginia Mallincott, is a masculine lesbian. So, so far, we know for a fact that on the NIV translating committee, they had two sodomites. We know it for sure. We know it for a fact. Here is um, Virginia Mallincott. Some of her books is The Homosexual, My Neighbor. One called The Divine Feminine. Another one called Transgender Journeys. Another one called Take Back the Word, which in her, in her language means these evil right-wing Christians have, have uh, destroyed the Bible and made it homophobic. So let's take it back and let's make it to where Jesus loves everybody regardless of their gender or their transgender or their affiliations or who they love or whatever because God, we know God is all about love and God's not going to punish anybody for anything they've ever done. That's her. Okay? Now, up till now, let me ask a question before it's getting close to 5 o'clock. Does anybody have any question... You're surrounded by tares. The tares are going to come at you. They're going to try to accuse you. They're going to mock you. They're going to try to change your mind on this issue. Is there any part of what you believe about your Bible that, or what I've said that I think you ought to believe about your Bible that you're not 
if somebody came to you with such and such a question, you're not sure you could answer it. Does anybody have a question like that or about anything that I've said so far on this? I've given you an hour to think about it. Let me run through this first issue while you're thinking. First issue is Bible inspiration. Do we believe that God literally inspired to the men who were writing it down? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Moses. Do we actually believe that the first five books were written by the very hand of Moses? Do we believe that's what we believe? And you'd be, a, you'd be surprised at the number of scholars in seminaries all around this country who don't believe that. I mean, I was, I was taught, I wasn't taught by men who don't believe, that, or at least I don't think I was, that didn't believe that Matthew wrote Matthew, but I was told that there are a lot of scholars who said Matthew didn't write Matthew. Mark did not write Mark. Paul did not write 1st, 2nd Corinthians. John did not write Revelation. I mean, they got all these reasons why they don't think that the original apostles wrote the books of the New Testament. Their theory is they were written later by churchmen in order to bring everybody under control under this certain doctrine. Okay? So, do we believe that, men in, that God inspired these men to write the very words that are, that are on the page? Do we believe that? Okay? How can you prove it? If somebody came to you and said, well, men wrote the Bible. I mean, I was at church and that's what they told me is that men wrote the Bible to scare little kids. I've heard that one before. Huh? You give them Bible verses. What? That's what I'm getting at. How can you say, what is it that you can reply to them of why you believe what you believe? Should I have a, a handout for you that gives you the Bible? And you know what? I'll, I'll try to do that. I think it would be a good idea to give you a handout of Bible verses of why we believe what we believe. Number one, Bible inspiration. Okay, you said, uh, okay, first, uh, first Timothy 3.16, for all scripture is given by uh, inspiration of God is profitable. For do all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Okay, it's profitable doctrine. Okay. So that's the first one. What's another one that proves the inspiration that God gave words to these men? Second Peter, chapter one: Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's a second verse that tells you that God gave the very exact words to these men. Who can have, who can give me a third one? Jared. Uh, the verse when the words of the Lord appear words, and try to inspire. Okay. What do you think? Okay, that could go towards inspiration, but it leans more toward preservation. Okay. okay, so we'll get to that in a minute. So, original inspiration. Because you, you may run into people who say, well, I believe the Bible was inspired in the originals, but I don't believe it's, I don't believe it's inspired now. I don't believe the translation can be inspired. That is a... There are other verses that say that, that prove that. Okay? How about... Huh? In the beginning was the Word. That's, here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what you believe, maybe, is that there is no difference between the Bible that you hold and the God you pray to. Right? You're saying that when I pray, that is me speaking to God. When I read my Bible, that is God speaking to me. Okay? That's very good. That's very, very... And then you can add to that Revelation 19. His name written is the Word of God. You can also add 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three... Or what? He didn't say the Son here. John called him the Word. John is, John is unique. John is the only disciple. 
that calls Jesus the Word by that, by that term. He used it in John. He used it in 1 John. Okay? So this is about the source of the Bible. It, it's either exactly what God said or God left us here alone by ourselves. Okay? So that's inspiration. What about Jeremiah chapter 1? God said, Jeremiah, I'm going to take my words... And I'm going to open your mouth and put my words in your mouth and you're going to speak what I give you to say. That's in Jeremiah chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3. In Ezekiel chapter 2, Ezekiel sees a hand. And in that hand is a scroll of a book. And Ezekiel is told to take, and on that roll of a book, it's written on both sides, just like in Revelation 5. It's really neat if you compare the two, because it's written on both sides, just like Revelation 5. And Ezekiel is told to take the book and eat it. So Ezekiel took the book, the roll, and he ate it. And he said, it tasted like what? Um, guy called me this weekend. Uh, Josh, Joshua. Um, anyway... He's been, we've been trading stuff back and forth, and he said, Pastor Mike, he said, you know what I found out about honey? How long does honey last? Does anybody know how long honey lasts? It never goes bad. It'll crystallize, and all you gotta do is heat it back up. Honey... How many places in the Bible were you told that the Word of God is sweet as honey? Tasted like honey. Okay? What did manna taste like? Manna tasted like honey. They were eating the Word. And the fact that honey never goes bad, never corrupts, you remember that. Okay? Honey never corrupts. Neither does God's Word. Okay? So anyway... That's Bible inspiration. He took the book and he ate it. And then God said, now go and speak to my people. So the very words came from God to these men and they wrote the exact words that God gave to each one of them. That's what we believe. Okay? Now, preservation. Jared, preservation. Yeah, that was pretty bad. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And you could throw in that those verses where, you know, thy word is like honey. And honey never, never corrupts. They found honey in one of the Egyptian tombs from thousands of years ago. Honey. Still intact. Okay? Uh, preservation. Who else? What else do you know about preservation? Bible preservation. Verses. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And he didn't say word. He said word. Okay, um, who, who knows another one? The grass withereth and the flower fadeth. This is Isaiah 40. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth away, but the words of our God shall stand forever. Forever. Okay, who knows another one? Uh, second, second Peter... One, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Forever. This is Bible preservation. Okay? This is why we believe what we believe on how God preserved. And see, 
they'll try to trip you up with all this well you know the manuscripts and they made mistakes and we know they made mistakes on this manuscript and that manuscript and, and all this and that and but here's here's what you're never never going to run into you are never going to have somebody who does not believe the inspiration preservation translation of the bible they will never be able to give you a single verse out of the bible that proves that they're right not one because how many verses are there that say that God's word would not last? There are none. How many verses in the Bible are there that state that God did not give all of these words? There are none. They don't have Bible verses. They have history lessons and philosophies and questions. But they don't have Bible verses. You should have them. You should have them here. But most importantly, you should have them here. Because if this is what you really believe, then don't believe it because I said so. Believe it because that's what God said. Amen? Stand to our feet. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll preach on Delilah next Sunday night. Delilah. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Father in heaven, your word is all powerful. When Jesus comes back to battle in the battle of Armageddon, he is going to use that sword that proceeds out of his mouth. And that sword is this book. Father, you taught us that when we stand against the wiles of the devil, that we're to use this book as a shield of faith, as a helmet of salvation, as loins girt about with truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. The gospel is in the word. God, you taught us that our greatest weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Lord, I don't have anything else. I'm not a pastor, Lord, and I can't talk to anybody except I give them what this book says. I am nothing without it. But Father, with it, I am everything. And these people are everything. And you have blessed us, Father, far beyond anything that we ever deserved because you've given us out of your greatest treasures of all. And your treasures are in this word. Father, feed us with it. Help us to stand upon it. Father, the tares are all around these people. And I can't be there to help defend them. I can't be there, Lord, when they're being attacked, when they're being questioned, when they're being ridiculed. But your word can be. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help my people to know it. To not just believe it, but to know it. And to know it well. That they would be able to withstand all the wiles of the devil. Because he is going to work against this book until he wins everybody here. And God, I really don't want that to happen to these people. I love them. I like them. So Father, I pray, dear God, that you would lead each one of them to study, to meditate, to know it, and to believe it. That way, you'll defend them wherever they go. Bless and honor your word tonight. I love you and I thank you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.